بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remind you that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ Which means the best amongst you is the one who learned the Qur'an and taught it to others. Tonight, insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll be explaining a new surah of the last part of the Qur'an named Surah Al-Inshiqaq. Allah ta'ala said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Iza samaun shakkat Now this surah al-Inshiqaq was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in Mecca. As we mentioned before some of the surahs were revealed to the Prophet while he was in Mecca while others revealed to the Prophet while he was in Medina. Now this Surah Al-Inshiqaq was revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca and it is comprised of 25 ayahs and that's the first one. إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ When the sky is cleft asunder split apart. al mawardi and others said that this is among the signs of the occurrence of the Day of Judgment. Now there are signs of the Day of Judgment that tell us that the occurrence of the Day of Judgment is very close. There are other signs, the major signs, that tell us that the occurrence of the Day of a Judgment is very, very close. And there are signs of the occurrence of the Day of a Judgment, the happening of the Day of a Judgment, and this is one of them. The minor signs first of the Day of a Judgment happen, then the major signs happen, then the hour, as-sa'a, or the day of the judgment will happen. The minor signs are heaps, numerous. Most of them happened already. When you see men imitating women, women imitating men, people drink alcohol excessively, people commit adultery and fornication excessively. When you see people competing to build high-rise buildings and uh, listening to music. All these signs are from the minor signs. Most of them happen. The major signs, none of them happened yet. And there are ten, as the Prophet wasallam named them in the Hadith. Ten major signs. After that, the Day of Judgment will happen. And this is amongst the signs of the occurrence of the Day of Judgment, when the sky cleft asunder, split apart. It will have cracks everywhere in the sky. Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet wasallam, said, in means to be cleaved 
by the white clouds. And the ayah means the sky shall cleave away, split, and split apart, and from the white clouds, and the angels shall descend in the white clouds. So when it splits apart, the angels will descend from these gaps on the white clouds to the earth. So that's the meaning of when the skies cleft asunder, split apart. This sky is very solid, well structured. Its thickness is 500 years, but it will have cracks. It will split apart on the day of judgment. وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ And hearkens and submits to the command of its Lord. And it will be truly bound to do so. So the meaning is that the sky shall attentively listen and obediently submit to the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahuqat means the sky rightfully listens and submits to its Lord and it will be truly bound to do so, rightfully. Because Allah deserves the ultimate submission and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves worship. The skies on the day of the judgment they will attentively listen to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will they will obey the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the meaning of وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ The skies, the well structured body will attentively listen and obediently submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ And when the earth is flattened out and widened for the assembly. Ibn Abbas said, the earth shall be flatly stretched and expanded. Imam Al-Qushayri said, the earth will be flattened, smooth, after its woods and mountains are demolished. This earth we are on now will be replaced with another one, different from this one. Now some scholars said, this earth will be completely destroyed and Allah creates another earth that is flat with no mountains, no valleys, it's very white like silver, it doesn't have root marks or traces, nothing. It's very plain, white like silver, flattened area. And some scholars said this earth will be reshaped and the mountains will be demolished. Nothing will remain from what is on earth now and it will be flat with no mountains, no valleys and people will be assembled on it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ This earth will be replaced with another one and they will be brought for the assembly and for the judgment. So this whole earth will be destroyed and will be replaced with another earth that is flat with no mountains, no valleys. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith يحشر الناس يوم القيامة على أرض بيضاء ملساء كقرصة النقي. Meaning, 
people will be assembled on the day of a judgment on a smooth land, white as the bread that is made from the purest flour. And it will be stretched in another narration, like the leather that is stretched and that you can see it's very flat, plain, no mountains, no valleys, nothing. So the earth that people will be assembled on on the day of the judgment is different from this earth. It's completely flat. And it will be stretched and widened. And all people from Adam till the day of the judgment will be assembled on it. Angels will be on that day as well, on this land. Every person will be brought to the assembly area, driven by an angel and another angel to witness. وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ Every single person will come on the day of judgment accompanied by two angels. One to guide him where he should be and the other one will witness. So that land is very big, very huge. And all of them will be assembled on it on that day. وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ And brings out and gives up the dead in it. So the earth will be flat, will be very wide, stretched and expanded. And what does it do as well? It brings out all the dead within the earth, inside the belly of the earth, will throw them out, will not keep any of the dead inside it, will take everyone out of it. That's on the day of judgment. Al-Hakim narrated from the root of Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas is the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was called Tarjuman al-Qur'an a well knowledgeable person about the meanings of the Qur'an he said the earth brings out the dead buried in it and gives them up until none are left so all the dead will be brought out of the earth from the belly of the earth, outside, none will remain underneath the ground. That's for the assembly. وَأَذِينَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ That's a repetition for the second area, which means the earth shall attentively listen and obediently submit to the order of Allah. And it rightfully listens and submits to its Lord. And this is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who deserves the ultimate submission and humility. We submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah deserves the ultimate submission. Allah is the creator of this whole universe. He deserves to be worshipped. He is the only one who is rightfully worshipped. He is the one who created us. A human being does not deserve to be worshipped. He is a creation as well. An animal doesn't deserve to be worshipped. He's a creation. And look at the human being. His life starts at a time, then it ends at another time. So his life is limited. His life is limited. This one who dies doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Animals do not deserve to be worshipped. Also the stones and the trees and anything else in this universe doesn't deserve to be worshipped. 
The only one who deserves to be worshipped is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the meaning of La ilaha illallah. When we say La ilaha illallah, no one is God except Allah. The scholars said it means no one deserves to be worshipped except Allah. So Allah is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Other than Allah, even prophets, angels, they do not deserve to be worshipped. So the skies, just imagine, the skies will listen attentively and obey and follow the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the earth will listen attentively and will follow the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The skies and earth will follow the command of Allah azza wa jal. Just think about yourself as a human being. Think about your creation compared to the seven skies. Think about your creation compared to this earth. You are a very weak creation. You are very weak compared to the seven skies. The skies and earth will listen attentively and will obey the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the skies will split apart and the angels will descend from these cracks that will be in the skies and the earth also will bring out all the dead people and will empty itself from them. So the earth and the skies will follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just think of this ayah. Allah ta'ala said, Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal-ardi wal-jibal فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقُنَ مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the scholars mentioned, offered the skies, the earth and the mountains. The option to have awareness and life and to be accountable if they obey, they will be admitted to paradise. And if they disobey, they deserve to be tortured. The skies, the earth and the mountains did not accept. Fearing that they won't be up to that responsibility. But the mankind took that responsibility. Now we are responsible, we are accountable. If we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's going to happen? We will be rewarded. If we disobey Allah azza wa jal, we deserve to be tortured. So if the skies, the earth will obey and follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what should we do? Then Allah Ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal insanu, innaka kadihun, ila rabbika kadihan famulaqih. Meaning, O son of Adam, you shall travail and toil toward meeting the judgment of your Lord. And the result of your deeds you shall face. And Nasafi said that this ayah addresses mankind. Al Az ibn Abdul Salam mentioned that the meaning of the ayah is O son of Adam, you shall work hard and toil toward meeting the judgment of your Lord. So that's what is known in Arabic as Al-Kadah, to travail and toil. You work very hard 
towards what? Meeting the judgment of your Lord. And that deserves working for. If you just think about the judgment, what's going to happen when you will be resurrected, you will be questioned about what you did in this life. Isn't it worth it working for that day? Very hard. It is worth it. Think about when you die, what's going to happen. Everyone will leave you in the grave and they will come back home. And just think about this. Even if they remember you after a while, if they are sitting around laughing, joking, and they remember you, they might make dua for you by saying, Allah yarhamu, may Allah have mercy on him. Then they continue laughing and joking. That's it, you become a forgot, forgotten memory. That's all what they think of you. It's like something in the past, something in the history. That's all what they can remember. If they remember you, they might say, Allah yarhamu, and that's it. And they continue. And you are left alone in the grave. So, it's worth it working for the grave. It's worth it working for the day of judgment. Very hard. Day and night. And this life, the pleasures of this life, are for one to get from it what he needs. You eat, you drink. See what you need from this life only. The necessary things then leave the rest, the pleasures of this life. Because that's a big burden. Thrown away. Think when you are going to be at your grave, by yourself, all your family members will leave you, will go back home to divide the inheritance. And you are going to be questioned about the money that you have collected in your life. So while they are enjoying using your money, spending your money in a joyful way, you are at your grave. And they might be a big burden for you. If you have collected that money from haram source, let us say, you might be getting tortured in the grave for collecting the money in that way and they are enjoying using your money and spending your money. So this area means the person, the son of Adam, works and acquires. He works with toil for the day of judgment and he shall see the result of his deeds on that day فَمُلَاقِي what you plant you reap in the hereafter and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said الدُّنْيَا مَزْرَعَةُ الْآخِرَةِ what you plant in this world you'll reap in the hereafter now usually if a person Plants, let us say, wait, would he get watermelons in the end? No. If he plants barley, corn, would he get dates in the end? No. What you plant, you reap. What you plant in this world, amongst the deeds, will reap the result on the day of judgment. So what's going to happen? Your deeds will be presented to you on that day. We're going to see your deeds. How are you going to take your book that recorded everything 
you have done in this life. From the good and the evil. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ As for the one who is given his book in his right hand, and those are the benevolent believers, the good believers, the pious believers, that one shall be given his book that has all the records in it, in his right hand. فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا So if he's amongst those pious believers, then he will take his book with his right hand. فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا And he shall be judged with an easy presentation. So the presentation of the deeds will be easy for that person. It won't be severe. It is the easy, light presentation of one's deeds. Al-Hakim narrated that the Prophet ﷺ explained Al-Hisab al yaseer that easy judgment, by saying, أَيَّنْظُرَ فِي سَيِّئَاتِهِ وَيَتَجَاوَزْ لَهُ عَنْهَا Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala although this slave has come on the day of judgment with sins and Allah knows about his sins but Allah will forgive his sins. So that's the light presentation, the easy presentation of the deeds that this person will be acknowledged about his bad deeds he will see him, but Allah will forgive him. Allah will forgive him and will not torture him for committing these sins. Al-Hakim said that this hadith is sahih. Imam al-Bukhari reported from Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet said, لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ يُحَاسَبُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ إِلَّا هلك. Now everyone will be judged. So what's the meaning of this hadith? It doesn't mean that everyone will be judged and tortured. No, it doesn't mean this. It means anyone who is questioned about his deeds shall be tortured. That's literally. Then Aisha radiallahu anha exclaimed by saying, Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا So those pious believers that will take the, their books with their right hands, they will be judged in an easy way, and the presentation of the deeds will take place in an easy and light way. That means they won't be tortured. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا ذَاكَ الْعَرْضِ وَلَيْسَ أَحَدٌ يُنَاقَشُ الْحِسَابَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِلَّا عزبا. Meaning, that is only in reference to the presentation of the deeds. That means everyone will be presented with his own deeds. He can see him. However, anyone who is severely questioned about all of his deeds shall be tortured. So some will be questioned, some will be seeing their deeds displayed in front of them, and they won't be questioned why they did this, why they did that, Allah will forgive them, those will not be tortured. However, others will be given their books and will be questioned about all of their deeds in a very harsh way and severe way, and those are the ones that are going to be tortured 
on the day of judgment, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Also, Al Hafiz ibn Hajar said that it is narrated in the Hadith of Jabir, according to Ibn Abu Hatim and Al Hakim, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. The one whose good deeds exceed his bad deeds shall enter paradise without being punished for his bad deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. So although this slave has come on the day for judgment with bad deeds, but because he also did good deeds in this life and his good deeds exceeded his bad deeds, this person will not be tortured for the bad deeds. That's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet said, the one whose good deeds are equal to his bad deeds shall be lightly presented with his deeds. His bad deeds will be overlooked, forgiven, after which he enters paradise. So that shows that who's going to go to paradise first? The one whose good deeds are more than his bad deeds will be admitted into paradise before the one whose good deeds are equal to his bad deeds. Now those whose good deeds are equal to the bad deeds are called Al-A'raf. It was narrated that those will wait on the wall of paradise before given the permission to be admitted into it. They wait and others will go to paradise first because the people of paradise won't be admitted into paradise all at once, no, batch after batch, group after another will be admitted into paradise. The poor people before the rich people why? Because the more money you have, the longer presentation of the deeds will take. So you have more money, you stay longer on Judgment Day. So the poor people will be admitted into paradise before the rich people. And those who are hasamat, the good deeds, are more than the sayyat, will be admitted to paradise before Al-A'raf, those whose good deeds are equal to their bad deeds. What about the third category? The Prophet said, and the one whose bad deeds exceed his good deeds is the one who had tormented himself. He abused himself. And the intercession is meant for his likes. That's the one who is in need to what? To the intercession. Al-Shafa'ah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith خُيِّرْتُ بَيْنَ الشَّفَاعَةِ وَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ نِصْفُ أُمَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ بِلَا عَزَابِ Meaning I was given the option either to choose a shafa'a, the intercession by which I can intercede for some so they won't be tortured, or that half of my nation will be admitted into paradise without torture. The Prophet ﷺ said, I chose the intercession. Then the Prophet said, because it covers more people, he explained why, it covers more people. Do you think it's for the pious people? No. Because the pious ones will be admitted to paradise with their good deeds. They're already pious, righteous. They don't need the intercession. They go to paradise by their good deeds. Then the Prophet said, rather, it's for those who are submerged in sins. Those who contaminated themselves with sins. Those are the ones who are in need to the intercession on the day of the judgment. The sinners, 
But the one who is pious, righteous, will be admitted to paradise without torture. He is not in need to the intercession. But the Prophet, however, will intercede for all. He will intercede for all. Now, the pious and righteous ones will benefit by the intercession of the Prophet by being raised in ranks in paradise. And the sinners will be benefited as well because the Prophet will intercede for every single person of this nation amongst the Muslims. The non-believers will not be given the intercession. And the prophets, the righteous Muslims, the angels, the martyrs will not intercede for the non-believers. Because intercession is only for the believers. So when the Prophet ﷺ intercedes for this nation, the pious ones will be raised in ranks. The sinners, some of them will be forgiven and they won't be tortured at all. While others will be admitted into hellfire and before they spend the time they deserve in hellfire, they will be taken out of hellfire by the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ. So the intercession of the Prophet benefits every single Muslim of this nation. And the Prophet will be granted on that day the greatest intercession, al-Shafa al Uthman. So what happens after that? So the righteous Muslim, the benevolent believer, will receive his book with his right hand. And the, his deeds will be presented to him without being questioned about all what he did. So it's an easy light presentation of the deeds. Then after that, he will be admitted into paradise. And there, as Allah said, وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا And he will turn to his wives in paradise joyfully. So the believer shall in paradise turn to his wives from al hur al ain the extremely beautiful woman of paradise that Allah created for him and his wives amongst the daughters of Adam. The believer when admitted into paradise no one will be single in paradise. Everyone will be married. Everyone will be married. When that believer goes into paradise, he will have wives from al hur al ain and those are creations distinct from angels, from uh, humans or jinn. So they are not jinn, they are not angels and they are not human beings. There are creations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in paradise to be as wise for the believers, and they are extremely beautiful. al hur al ain their eyes are wide and beautiful. So they have wide and beautiful eyes. Those are al hur al ain Also the one will have wives from the daughters of Adam, the human beings. So that's the meaning of وَيَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا After he receives that light, Judgment, easy judgment, the presentation of the deeds will take place in a very easy way. He will be admitted into paradise without uh, getting tortured in hellfire. And there will he, he will turn to his wives amongst al hur al ain and amongst the daughters of Adam. Masrura means very happy and joyful for the endowment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him. So that's regarding the believer. That's regarding the believer. So the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith told us about the types of people on the day of the judgment, the believers. They are of three types, three categories. Some believers, their good deeds will exceed their bad deeds. 
and those will be admitted into paradise straight away. Some, their good deeds will be equal to their bad deeds, and those are called Ahlul A'raf. They will wait on the wall of paradise before being allowed to be admitted into paradise. Then, we have the sinners and those whose bad deeds exceed their good deeds. Those, we say, are under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Had Allah will for them to be tortured, they will be tortured. So for some, they will be definitely getting tortured in a hellfire. And for others, they will be forgiven. But who is going to be forgiven and who is going to be tortured? Allah knows best. Some of the sinners, so if you hear of someone that used to be a sinner, he used to drink alcohol, he used to gamble, he used to commit fornication, adultery, he used to take drugs, he used to do such and such and such amongst the sins, then he died in that state before repentance. You don't say about him, definitely he will be tortured, and you don't say, definitely he will be forgiven. How would you know if Allah is going to forgive him or not? You don't know. We say, we ask Allah to forgive him for what he used to do. And for others, for others as well, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. But that doesn't mean that every single one of the sinners will be tortured. And it doesn't mean that every single person amongst the sinners will be forgiven. Some will be tortured. Even Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ That's in Surah An-Nisa. What does it mean? Meaning Allah doesn't forgive the one who died in the state of shirk while associating partners with Allah. So the one who died in that state won't be forgiven. And the one who dies in the state of blasphemy won't be forgiven. He will be in hellfire forever. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Meaning, Allah forgives whomever He will amongst those who committed something less than blasphemy, Allah forgives some and Allah doesn't forgive others. So some of the sinners will be tortured, some of the sinners will be forgiven. That's in the ayah. Also the Prophet wasallam mentioned in the hadith about one of the companions who stole something from the spoils, the Prophet said about him, he's in hellfire and he, and he will be tortured with what he stole in hellfire. So the Prophet mentioned that he is going to be tortured in hellfire. So that's why what is mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith, that some will be tortured amongst the Muslim sinners and some will be forgiven. Now, who's going to be forgiven? Who's going to be tortured? Allahu A'lam. That's why one is not allowed to make a supplication that contradicts this belief. One is not allowed to say, for instance, O oh Allah, I ask you to forgive every single Muslim and not to torture every single Muslim and admit, admit every single Muslim to paradise. He can't say this, because that's against what Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, and against what the Prophet wasallam mentioned in the Hadith. However, one can say, one can say, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive the believers. Now by saying, oh Allah, forgive the believers, Amongst the males and females, the male believers and the female believers, one does not mean by saying this, not to torture any of them, 
Rather, he would mean by saying, Oh Allah, forgive every male and female believer, meaning for some, forgive all of their sins, and for the rest, forgive some of their sins. But one cannot say, Oh Allah, forgive every single Muslim and do not torture every single Muslim in that context, one can say. Why? Because Allah mentioned in the Quran that some will be tortured. The Prophet mentioned about some of the companions at his time. He said about a person he would be tortured in hellfire. It was narrated that once the companions came to the Prophet ﷺ, and they talked about someone who was fighting courageously with a lot of bravery, was very brave and courageous, he was fighting. And they were talking about him, how excellent, how astonishing the way he was fighting. The Prophet said he's in hellfire. They were shocked. So they are telling the Prophet about his bravery and how courageous he was in the fight. And the Prophet said to them, he's in hellfire. Then towards the end of the battle, this person was injured, that he couldn't handle the pain, he was suffering. So he brought a piece of metal and he killed himself with it. So he committed suicide. They were talking about his way of fighting, his courage, and his bravery, and the Prophet said he's, said he's in hellfire. Then they came to the Prophet, and they told him that he killed himself. The Prophet said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Sadaqa Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah is truthful. Meaning what I told you earlier, that's the meaning of it. Look what he did to himself, he killed himself. And because of that, the Prophet said, he's going to be tortured in hellfire. So not everyone will be tortured amongst the sinners and not everyone amongst the sinners will be forgiven. Now in another hadith narrated by Imam Muslim under the title the one who commits suicide is not a blasphemer he mentioned the hadith when two of the companions of the Prophet immigrated together from Mecca to al Madina. On the way, one of them became very sick to an extent that he couldn't handle the pain he was experiencing. So he brought a piece of metal and he chopped off his fingers. He started bleeding until he died. His friend saw him in a dream. Saw him in a dream and he was happy. He said to him, what happened to you? He said, Allah forgave me because of my immigration from Mecca to Medina to follow the Prophet. Because it was very rewardable and it was compulsory as well upon everyone who was able. So he said, Allah forgave me because of my immigration from Mecca to Medina to follow the Prophet. Then he realized that his hand was wrapped, covered. He said, what happened to your hand? He said, it was said to me, so we won't fix what you have ruined. Then that companion, after he woke up, he continued his way to Medina. He went to the Prophet. And he told the Prophet about the dream that he saw about his friend. Then the Prophet raised his hands. And he said, O oh Allah, وَلِيَدَيْهِ فَغْفِرْ وَلِيَدَيْهِ فَغْفِرْ Literally means forgive his hands. So the Prophet wouldn't make supplication for someone who is 
a non-believer to be forgiven, the Prophet wouldn't make supplication to someone who uh, died as a non-believer to be forgiven. And that shows that he didn't die as a non-believer. He died as a Muslim. But he committed a major sin by killing himself. So this one was forgiven and the other one was tortured. So some of the sinners who died without repentance will be tortured and others will be forgiven. That's why one can say, Oh Allah, forgive every believer. And the meaning of it will be, for some, forgive all their sins, and for others, forgive some of their sins. And it was narrated in the hadith that if you say, Allahumma ufir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, you'll have rewards by the number of every believer. How many believers are there amongst the males and females? You'll get rewards by that number. But what you cannot say, Oh Allah, forgive all the believers, do not torture any of them. He can't say that type of supplication because it's against the Quran. Also, from the hadith that we mentioned earlier about the intercession, we can conclude something. That when the Prophet chose the intercession, we knew that, and he said, Aam wa Akfa covers more people, that more than half of his nation will be admitted into paradise without torture. This is a great endowment. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting in a session once, and he mentioned in that session that 70,000 of this nation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, showed him the people on the day of judgment, how the situation will be. And he mentioned that a prophet will come with two or three men with him. That's all, that's his nation. Another prophet will come with only very little number of people around him. That's in the past. You know, Prophet Nuh stayed with his people for 950 years, calling them to embrace Islam. Only about 83 embraced Islam. 950 years. So the prophet mentioned that on the day for judgment, a prophet will come with two, three people, another one with maybe more and less, something like this. Then the Prophet looked and he saw a big nation, a big nation. He thought that's his nation and it was said to him, now that's the nation of Moses. Then he was told to look at the far east and far west and he looked and he saw a big, big majority of people, big group, it was said, this is your nation, from east and west. And it was said to him that 70,000 people will be admitted into paradise without torture and without harsh judgment. Meaning they will have easy presentation of the deeds, they will be admitted into paradise and they won't be tortured. Then, one of the companions called Ukasha ibn Muhsin. Ukasha ibn Muhsin stood up. They were very lucky. And he said to the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, make dua for me so I'll be one of them. And the Prophet said, You are one of them. On the spot, gave him the good tidings that he won't be tortured. He said, you are one of them. Then another person stood up and said, and me, O Messenger of Allah. Then the Prophet said, Sabaqaka biha ukasha. Means he said it first. But that doesn't mean this person will be tortured. But the Prophet named him. 
That's in a hadith. In another hadith, the Prophet mentioned ten. All of them in one hadith called al ashara Mubasharuna Bil Jannah. He gave them the good tidings that they would be in paradise. Ten mentioned them. He said Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah. He named ten that they will be in paradise and they won't be tortured on the day of judgment. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be amongst those who will be admitted into paradise without torture. And that shows brothers and sisters that the minority groups that emerge these days who call themselves with different names and they are very minorities and despite that they judge the majority of Muslims around the world as non-Muslims. They're not even one million if you want to count them. They judge one billion and over a billion of Muslims around the world as non-Muslims and they believe that they are going to thus minority or this minority will go to paradise and that majority will go to hellfire. This is against what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith. That the majority of the nation will be always on the right path. So Alhamdulillah for making us amongst the majority of this nation, the people of the truth, people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate for us the roots of success and to make us die as righteous Muslims. Ameen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We say la ilaha illallah three times.